Hello everyone! This is a video about an ancient Chinese painting called the Three Vinegar Tasters, or actually a little bit more precisely, it is not a painting, it is a subject of painting. There's a ton of these paintings and they all have the same, um, you know, basic subject material, but they're all painted by different um, artists at different time periods in different places and so forth, and they're small stylic stylistic differences. Uh, but they're all the same painting and it's called the Vinegar Tasters. And we're talking about it because it is a really interesting way to look at the three great schools of thought in Chinese history, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism, and about how they see the world and about how they think we should act in the world. Okay, so one sort of point of comparison you could say is that in Western painting, and I, I believe this started with Dutch painters, I'm not 100% sure on that, but um, painting still lives of fruit, right? So you, you go around to art galleries or whatever, you see this hanging in people's houses, sometimes you see a painting of fruit and you're like, why is there a painting of fruit? And part of the answer is because, you know, traditions can just sort of carry themselves on for a long time, even when nobody else knows what's really going on or why we're doing it. Uh, so you paint fruit because everybody painted fruit. Um, there could also be some practical reasons, like for instance, the fact that if you want to paint a portrait, you need somebody to sit for the portrait. And people sometimes have a hard time sitting still for long periods of time. However, fruit is actually really good at sitting still for long periods of time. And so you paint fruit because the fruit is a good subject. It just sort of sits there and gives you plenty of time to practice. Um, there's also kind of this, uh, let's say, philosophic twist on painting fruit, which is this. Fruit is something which, you know, we all like and which, particularly in a pre-refrigeration age, is extremely uh, limited in time. It's something that rots and corrupts quite quickly, right? You leave fruit alone for a matter of days or even in the right conditions for a matter of hours and all of a sudden the quality goes downhill really fast and pretty soon it's just gone and it is no longer, uh, you know, uh, beautiful and sweet and delicious like fruit is and should be. And so there's something really interesting about taking this, you know, very transient, very temporary thing like fruit and capturing it in a painting, right? Freezing it in time, uh, finding a way to turn what is temporal and transient and limited into what is, you know, sort of infinite and eternal. I know paintings don't last forever, but they last a lot longer than fruit, so it's a pretty good shot. And so there's something kind of interesting and philosophic there also about humans, you know, because humans kind of try to do that, right? We are limited, finite, transient creatures, and we are often, or maybe even always, trying to find, like, what is most enduring or most eternal or most, um, you know, uh, transcendent and permanent about human life and about ourselves. Um, so in this, you know, very simple painting, which is just, you know, a very, very ordinary painting subject, it's just fruit in a bowl, um, there's kind of some interesting philosophical significance. And it is the same thing with the painting of the three vinegar tasters. All right, so the three vinegar tasters. Who are the three vinegar tasters? Well, they are Confucius, Lao Tzu, and the Buddha, right? Three titans of Chinese thought. And it's kind of funny to describe it that way, obviously, because the Buddha is technically not Chinese, he is Indian. That is where Buddhism originates. Um, but obviously very, very, very prominent in Chinese thought. So, you know, it's 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 a pretty fair choice. So you have the Buddha and Confucius and Lao Tzu, and all of them are gathered around a big vat of vinegar. And each one has dipped their finger in and is tasting it. And all of them have a different expression on their faces. And the idea is that the expression on their faces is going to tell us something about how each of these three individuals is tasting the vinegar and reacting to it and therefore how they are seeing the world and how they believe we should react to that vision of the world. And obviously by extension, this is presumably telling us something about Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism writ large. Okay, so what are their expressions and what are they saying? Well, let's start with the Buddha. So the Buddha is um, tasting the vinegar and in different paintings, he will have either what is described as a bitter expression or sometimes a blank expression. So what's going on there? Well, first of all, he is tasting the vinegar as bitter. And similarly, he sees the world as bitter. It is full of suffering. It is full of pain. It is full of limitation, deprivation, death, sickness, old age, right? Those are the, the famous things that um, Siddhartha Gautama, who would become the Buddha as a young prince, went out and found in the world that troubled him, right? Things like old age, sickness, and death, right? That befall all of us. And so the Buddha is going to see uh, the vinegar as bitter. He's going to see life as bitter. And his remedy is going to be 
to extinguish our desires. And actually, by the way, that is what nirvana means, as it means an extinguishing or a quenching, right? Like snuffing out a candle, right? So the problem here, according to the Buddha, is that life is just, like, life kind of sucks, right? It is intractably problematic. It is intractably bitter and full of suffering and loss and disappointment. And the correct response to that, sort of the correct remedy for the situation, is essentially to extinguish your desires. The problem is you are expecting too much from life, right? You are expecting life to be good, and you know, uh, it just kind of ain't. And so if you can extinguish those desires, if you can sort of like um, stop craving, right? Buddhism talks a lot about craving, right? The problem is your cravings. The problem is that you want things. And if you could just stop wanting things and accept that, uh, you know, old age, sickness, death, and all the <clears throat> various evils and problems of life do in fact exist and are an intractable and uh, uh, non-removable part of our existence, well, that's really sort of the solution to life. That is what life is. That is how we should act in it. Okay, so let's move on to Confucius. Now, Confucius is tasting the vinegar, and he tastes it as sour, and he kind of has a, an expression of distaste on his face. He doesn't like the taste of vinegar. And uh, unlike the Buddha, Confucius thinks he's got a solution. Confucius is uh, sort of the great lawgiver of China, and he is very interested in rules. He is very interested in structure. He's very interested in social structure. He's very interested in tradition and ancestors and uh, about bringing ourselves into accordance with an external objective standard. Uh, and so his solution is so, so okay so first of all he's seeing the world as uh, sour and flawed and there are some people who think that he's tasting the vinegar uh, and tasting it as polluted wine so he's tasting it and thinking hey wait a second this should be wine this should be something that we enjoy that is good and it isn't so we need to fix that and the way we're going to fix that is by bringing it back to that original standard we're going to bring it back and compel it to adhere um, to, to what it should be. And that is his view on the world, that it is flawed and broken, and that is also his solution. Um, through the exercise of, of discipline and ethical conduct, we are going to bring life back and make it what it should be and what it can be. Um, so he's sort of similar to the Buddha in the way that he sees life as flawed, but he doesn't see it as irremediably flawed. And he also um, doesn't have quite such a dim view of desire, right? He thinks that we could actually have good desires, that if we desired to bring ourselves in accordance with that original ideal standard, if we could desire to be wine instead of vinegar, then that is actually a really good desire. And that's actually a desire we can reach. And by contrast, Buddhism is going to say, hey, you know, uh, how about no? Like that desire is itself something that you need to extinguish because it itself invites suffering into your life. Okay. So Confucius is a reformer. Let's move on to Lao Tzu. Now Lao Tzu is my favorite of the three personally. Um, I do sympathize with his approach a little bit more than the others, although I'll have more to say about that, and it is not that simple. Um, but Lao Tzu is tasting the vinegar, like the other two, and he usually has a smile on his face, perhaps an expression of surprise. So what is going on with Lao Tzu? Well, Lao Tzu is tasting the vinegar as sweet, is one interpretation. And uh, by extension, notice that he's making a very different judgment about life and existence and experience than the other two are, where the other two are fundamentally judging life and finding it to be uh, uh, insufficient. Lao Tzu is tasting it and finding it to be ultimately sufficient. Now, there's also another interpretation on his reaction, which is not that he's actually literally tasting it as sweet, which is kind of weird because, you know, if you have tasted vinegar, as most human beings have, you would know that it is just not sweet. So, like, are Lao Tzu's taste buds broken or, like, what's going on here? One way of interpreting Lao Tzu's expression is that is not that he's actually tasting it as sweet, um, but that he is tasting it as vinegar and saying, yeah, you know, you could say that this is bitter and sour, and I suppose it is, but above all, it is vinegar. And this is what vinegar should taste like. It's because it tastes like that that we are able to make things like salad dressings and pickles, uh, which are wonderful, delicious things. So the, the problem is not that the vinegar in its sourness or bitterness, that's not the problem. The problem is that you're tasting it as sour and bitter and thinking that that is the problem, right? That that is a bad thing. This tastes like vinegar, 
It should taste like vinegar. That's what it means to be vinegar. That is a good thing. And because it is in accordance with its right nature, because it is what it should be, because it is what it is, that means that um, in some sense it is sweet. Uh, not in the literal sense of tasting like candy, um, but in uh, you know, sort of a, a broader, more general sense of saying, this is the way it should be. This is good. All right. Um, okay, so <clears throat> this is kind of interesting. One question you could ask, and you can chip in in the comments below and tell me what you think, is which one of these three approaches is the right one? Which one is better than the others? Uh, you know, or perhaps maybe you think that two of them are really good and the other one is uh, the bad one. To further explain uh, these three attitudes, here's an analogy that um, some people I know came up with when I first encountered this painting. Um, and it is, you could also see these three not as vinegar tasters, but you could see them as people floating down a river in an inner tube. And the Buddha is going to say something like, hey, you know, this river is full of rocks and rapids um, that can dump us, that can drown us. Uh, sometimes the sun is shining too brightly, the curves in the river take us to places we don't want to go, and the real problem here is that we don't want it to be that way. Our desires are what is causing our suffering. We just need to accept the fact uh, you know, that we're going to tip over and drown or get dashed against the rocks when we hit the rapids, or that we're going to get a sunburn. The problem is that you desire to not have these things, and if you can extinguish your desire and just sort of like float down the river with a poker expression on your face, that's the best way to approach life. That's the way that is going to minimize suffering. Or the Buddha might also say something like, gee, you know, this whole river is, is, is problematic. This whole river is a problem in and of itself. So really what we should be trying to do is get out of the river, right? This river is nothing but trouble. Now Confucius is going to have one of two attitudes regarding this river as he floats down on his hypothetical inner tube. And one attitude is he's going to be, you know, if we could just get a paddle and navigate properly down the river, we could do this right. And yes, there are rapids, and yes, it, the river takes the wrong curves, and maybe what we could even do, and this is the second perspective, he says, maybe what we could do is we could get a big social project. We could get backhoes and excavators and a landscaping crew and maybe a weather control crew, and we could make this river what it really could be, what it really should be, what like the ideal tubing river would be like. And it's going to uh, be perfectly straight, except for where it should be curved, and then all the curves will be in the right places where they should be. And then, uh, you know, we will get rid of all the rapids, get rid of all the danger, and we will also, uh, you know, plant trees along the bank at appropriate times so that you get some shade, but not too much shade, because, you know, you kind of like both. You want the sunshine and the shade. And maybe we'll get a weather control project going so that there is the exact right amount of clouds at any given time so that, um, you know, it's you know, a nice sunny day, which is what you want when you're tubing, but also not too warm and you don't get sunburned too badly. And that is what the ideal river is going to look like, and that is what we are going to do. That's a Confucian approach. Lao Tzu, on the other hand, is going to have um, an approach where he thinks something like, you know, this river has a lot of unexpected curves, and some of them are not the particular turns and twists that I would have chosen. Uh, and sometimes I get sunburned and sometimes it's a little too chilly because a cloud covers the sun. Uh, and once I got caught in tree roots and uh, twice I got dumped in the rapids. But at the end of the day, uh, that's just what a river should be. That's what the experience of tubing down a river is and should be. And so I am happy and I am going to enjoy the ride down the river with all of its twists and turns, with all of its dumps. And if I drown, you know, it was a lot of fun, still worth it. And that is, uh, you know, maybe in another hundred years we will not have paintings of the vinegar tasters. Instead, we will have paintings of the three inner tubers. That's maybe like a 21st century version of the painting of the vinegar tasters. So maybe you think that one is better than another. And if I had to choose only one, I would probably choose Lao Tzu's. I find myself a little bit more drawn to Taoism, and I find uh, there to be certain flaws in the Confucian and Buddhist approach. But, however, let me propose an even more interesting interpretation, far more interesting, I think. And I'm not the one who's proposing this, by the way. Many other people have thought of this, but here is the interpretation. All three of them are gathered around the same vat of vinegar, and they're tasting the exact same vinegar. So you could look at all three of them and say, maybe what this painting is expressing 
is that these three schools of thought, if we understood them properly, they would actually be one and the same. They would be harmonious. Let me propose three ways that that might work out. So one way you could see them as being harmonious is you could say, uh, you know, all three of these approaches are actually pretty good approaches. They're just good at different times and places. And then you harmonize between them just by putting the right one into the right situations. This would be similar to sort of how we think about like saws and screwdrivers and hammers. It's not that one is, you know, in this grand transcendent sense better than the others. They're just good for different things and they're useful at different times. And you should probably have all three of them in many cases. Um, and then just use them when they're appropriate. And if you try to hammer in a nail with a screwdriver or a saw, well, isn't that just because you don't understand their nature and you don't understand the way to harmonize between them? That's one way you could look at it. And I think that many people will sympathize with that view because if you squint at all three of these approaches, the Buddhist approach of saying, you know, like we need to extinguish and, um, uh, yeah, we need to extinguish our desires. We're expecting a little bit too much from life. And then the Confucian approach where um, you try to adhere to an external standard and essentially fix things. And then also the Taoist approach where you try to appreciate things for what they are and learn from them rather than trying to reject them or fix them. Um, many of us use all three of these approaches at different times and in different circumstances in our lives. Sometimes we do sit back and think, you know, my expectations are too high and I need to curb my desires, I need to bring down my expectations just a little bit, and then I genuinely will be happier. Um, you know, there are such things as unreasonable desires and unreasonable expectations that are probably just bringing me suffering. We also often have the approach of saying, you know, uh, maybe it would be really good to adhere to an external standard and maybe that would be difficult. Maybe that would even incur some suffering along the way because, you know, as, as you progress towards a goal, you will be falling short of that goal and that will, you know, the the um, the fact that that desire is not yet brought to fruition will bring you stress and anxiety and suffering, but maybe that's still the best thing to do. Many of us do follow that approach whenever we set goals, especially lofty goals, or we try to move somewhere in life. Um, you know, we are in some sense using the Confucian approach, aren't we? And then I think we also, um, many of us, in many circumstances, find it really valuable to use Lao Tzu's approach. We taste life the way he tastes the vinegar. And we say, you know, perhaps if we fail or if we encounter a disappointment or even, you know, very cataclysmic and traumatic events, um, sometimes what we do, and it seems to be a really good thing to do, is we back up and we say, you know, I am going to try to find the good in this. And I'm going to try to, um, I'm going to try to use this as a learning experience. I'm going to do my best to not reject or try to fix what's going on, but I'm going to do my best to look at it and say, okay, how could I better appreciate things? How could I, um, you know, uh, rather than imposing my will on the universe, maybe I could look and try to find the ways that the universe is actually doing something pretty good and I'm the one who needs to be fixed. So we actually do use all three of those approaches at different times. All of us do. Or, or at least most of us do. And so I think a lot of people will find a lot of, a lot of truth in the view that these three vinegar tasters, they're actually, they all have a really good point and they're all just different strategies that we could employ at different times. Now, here's another way of viewing them as harmonious is you could view them as informing one another. You could view, you could use one to kind of shape the way that another one plays out. So for instance, um, if you're a Confucian, if you're taking a Confucian approach to life, um, one of the perhaps more um, negative and destructive ways that that could play out is you could say something like, you know, uh, I, I have this lofty goal, um, either for career or education or, or fitness or what have you, um, and I'm going to reach for it, I'm going to stretch for it, right? I'm going to turn that vinegar back into wine, and um, a, a very you know, sort of toxic way of doing this is to is is the perfectionist approach, which is um, everything I am and do is entirely worthless until I reach that goal, right? And that is obviously not so good. So 
you could use Lao Tzu to kind of inform that and fix that. And you could say, well, yeah, like I'm, I'm still going to reach for this goal. I'm still going to stretch myself and I'm still going to, you know, embark on this journey with a destination at the end. But I'm going to value the journey and not just the destination. I'm going to say that that, that process of working and suffering and yes, failing along the way, that itself is valuable and good and has things to teach me. And I cannot, uh, you know, disdain or reject that or be angry at that. Um, you know, just because it isn't where I'm trying to end up. Uh, to coin a phrase, journey before destination. So that is another way that you could um, look at these three as harmonious, is you could use one to inform the others. One more interesting example of that is that you could use Confucianism to inform Buddhism. Um, you know, sometimes the right approach, I think we would all agree, is the Buddhist approach of saying, you know, my, my desires are just too lofty here. I have unrealistic expectations about what I can achieve particularly within a limited time frame. And the Confucian, you know, Confucianism could inform that a little bit and say, hey, yeah, you know, like we should probably be bringing down our expectations somewhat. We need to curb our desires somewhat. Um, but, you know, maybe there are some desires that we could reach for and that we could actually uh, succeed in grasping, right? We could actually get there. We could actually make things better. Maybe not perfect, maybe not as good as we would really like them, but we could make them pretty good. And even those small, you know, Confucian steps to rectify the world or to rectify ourselves could be, you know, pretty solid. Maybe we could temper the Buddhist approach with a little bit of Confucianism. Conversely, you could also temper Confucianism with Buddhism and say, you know, uh, we need to make sure that we're setting realistic goals and that our desires are realistic. Um, that is another way that you could use one to inform the other and to make it better and healthier. So that's, uh, you know, the second way, right? that you could see them all as harmonious is you could use one to inform the other. There's also, and this is kind of like, this is kind of crazy and I'm not even sure what it would look like, but you could perhaps have an attitude that employs all three perspectives at the exact same time. I don't know exactly what that would look like. If you've got an idea, tell me in the comments below because I think this is really interesting. But I think it would look something like you saying, things are bad, that's the Buddhist approach, and I can fix them, that's the Confucian approach, by properly appreciating them, that's the Taoist approach. Now that is a crazy, wacky idea. Things are bad, but I can fix them by appreciating them. I think it would look something like that. I don't know exactly, but it's interesting, isn't it? Maybe if you could uh, get Confucius and the Buddha and Lao Tzu all together and kind of like put all their ideas in a blender, you'd get like this amazing philosophic ethical smoothie that would solve all of our problems. Who knows, right? And I don't know, if you if you put them all together, what would that be? That'd be like uh, Budfusa, right? Combining all three names or... Um, Laudatious? I don't know. Yeah, that's probably a bad idea. I think we should just keep calling them Buddha, Confucius, and Lao um, But there might, that's a third way that you might see them as being harmonious, is you might be able, you might say, no, really, if we understood all three of them and blended them perfectly, we would be able to do all three at the same time. Interesting, right? Okay, so that is the painting of the three vinegar tasters, a few different interpretations of them. I do think that this is really important. All of us at different times find different kinds of challenges and disappointments, and we have to figure out how to deal with those. We have to figure out how to um, change or adjust or get rid of certain desires we have. We have to figure out our path through life, how we're going to approach things, how we're going to judge the world and what our standard of success is going to be. And the painting of the three vinegar tasters is a, a really profound exploration into ways that we could approach those problems. Tell me what you think in the comments below. All kinds of comments are obviously very helpful because um, they, they boost the algorithm and more people see this video and learn about um, uh, Dutch still lives and uh, painting and rivers and inner tubes and, you know, other very deeply important things like that. So thanks very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.